This is a lecture for my professional responsibility class. We're going to be talking about 1.8i. I know this doesn't sound very interesting, but we're, this is a rule about acquiring a proprietary interest in the litigation, in litigation for your client. Just a quick reminder, we have a number of conflicts of interest rules. The biggest one is 1.7 we spent the most time on in my professional responsibility class. 1.8 takes a lot of time, but it's really a collection of little specific or special rules about the lawyer's self-interest um, that can affect, that can create a conflict of interest in representing a client. And um, 1.8i is near the tail end of this group of special rules. Here's our rule. A lawyer shall not acquire a proprietary interest in the cause of action or subject matter of litigation that the lawyer is conducting for a client, except that the lawyer may acquire a lien authorized by law to secure the lawyer's fee or expenses, or contract with a client for a reasonable contingent fee in a civil case. So here's our two takeaways. You're not allowed to like buy your way into a case. and um, Old common law, um, in, in centuries past, there was a concern that um, unscrupulous lawyers in order to, would basically pay clients for the chance to represent them in litigation and, and kind of buy their way into a lawsuit um, so that then they could get um, part of the, a windfall when they won the case or the case was settled. And so that's what we're saying that you're not allowed to do. Um, it's very hard by the, for my students, I got to tell you, um, it's really hard to find recent cases um, or disciplinary actions related to this rule. Um, and so when you're out in practice, after you take my course, if you ever have an issue with proprietary interest in the litigation come up, I want you to send me an email um, because I never see disciplinary actions about this. And have um, searched several times for cases from the last 20 years even um, related to the rule and, and they're hard to find. Um, so you, uh, for purposes of the MPRE, um, you, you may be asked whether contingent fees are permissible at all. You should be aware that some of the other common law countries actually don't allow contingent fees or don't let or strongly disfavor them and think it's weird that we do. And <clears throat> um, also, it's very common the MPRE will have at least one question about a lawyer taking a lien, kind of like a mechanic's lien or a plumber's lien um, uh, on the, the client or the client's file and papers and so forth as a security for um, the fee in case the client doesn't pay you. Let's move on to the comments. Comment 16 starts the discussion of 1.8i. Paragraph I states that the traditional general rule that lawyers are pro prohibited from acquiring a proprietary interest in litigation. Like paragraph E, which we discuss in another lecture, the general rule has its basis in common law champerty and maintenance. So that's our vocab words for, uh, for this lesson. Um, and we have another word that we'll encounter later in the course that our common law regulations of lawyers were about baritry statutes and which was about solic basically solicitation of clients and then we called this what we're talking about here we used to call champerty or champerty and maintenance it's designed to avoid giving the lawyer too great an interest in the representation in other words you can have too much skin in the game as a lawyer where we're worried that you're not being a faithful agent for the client and instead you're looking out for your own interests before those of the client that's what this rule is about in addition, when the lawyer acquires an ownership interest in the subject of the representation, it will be more difficult for a client to discharge the lawyer if the client so desires. So I want you to imagine, for example, that um, you have a client and it's a property claim. Uh, they're disputing the ownership. It's an adverse possession claim or a boundary dispute with a neighbor or something like that. You're representing the client. They don't have fees to pay you. And so you agree to take a, an assignment, a a, a tenancy in common or a joint tenancy of the property, a, a percentage share of the property itself in lieu of fees. Now, you may be thinking, well, this is contingent. I mean, if, if we lose a case, then I'm not going to have anything, let's I suppose. But um, I hope you can see that you've kind of become a co-client or a co-party, another party in the case, because you are 
at least a, a, an owner with a claim of title, of partial title um, to the race of the jurisdiction. This could also be about intellectual property and so forth. And so we can, in non-litigation settings, I mentioned this in a previous um, uh, lecture, that um, you could have a client, for example, who can't pay you and they're an inventor and you do their patent work. And so what they do is they assign to you, in lieu of their fees, a 5% um, a share in the royalties or the patent. Um, or you're setting up a business and they give you a 5% ownership share of the business going forward. And, and that's going to come under 1.8A as a business transaction with the client and so forth. But this is different. This is litigation where the ownership interest, the, the property that the client has signed over to you, uh, signed a share of to you as a payment for the fees, is actually the property in dispute in the case. And this essentially makes you a party in the litigation along with your client, and that's a problem. That creates a special type of conflict of interest. And so, first of all, we're worried that you will be biased. That was the pre previous slide. But secondly, imagine that the client has a falling, decides that you're a jerk or incompetent and wants to fire you. We want clients to actually have the right to fire their lawyers. And, and they can't get rid of you now because you're in the case. You own the property too. You're essentially a party. In addition, paragraph I sets forth um, exceptions for liens authorized by law to secure the client's fees or expenses and contracts for reasonable contingent fees. And the law of each jurisdiction determines which liens are authorized by law. Um, we, there, uh, for this, by the way, there's a, several sections of the restatement third of the law governing lawyers that go into um, nice detail about the majority rule, explaining the rule in different states and kind of sum up what the majority position is about lawyers' liens um, in order to secure uh, the, the payment of fees from clients. And I really, really encourage you to review those restatement sections about lawyer liens before you take the MPRE or maybe my final exam um, because that's our primary basis. Um, if you don't, then um, what I will tell you is that the question should at least say that the lawyer will comply with state law. And what we're doing here is hedging because every state has state-specific laws about how liens work, where you file it, um, when you can do this, when, when it can be discharged, and so forth. And they're basically saying you do have to comply with the state law for, for doing it. Now, these may include liens granted by statutes, so maybe automatically, liens originating in common law, and liens acquired by contract with the client. When a, con a lawyer uh, acquires a contra by contract a security interest in property, other than that, recovered through the lawyer's efforts in the litigation, such an acquisition is a business or financial transaction with a client and is governed by the requirements of paragraph A, of 1.8A, as I said a moment ago. So here's our review question to make sure that you got the point of this lecture. Would it be proper under the model rules for a lawyer to acquire a lien following procedures authorized by state law to secure the lawyer's fees or fee or expenses, A, yes, or B, no? If you don't know the answer to that, you should review the lecture. 